police started from a mistake made in the news, made on, on one of the local cable TV stations. I, twice a year I do a thing called fortifications tour, where we just go out and walk around and four fortifications. But we sent the news release out to one of the local cable TV stations. And they kind of misspelled fornication. And it came out fornication to them. <laughs> we only got one complaint. <laughs> okay. So, of course, all of the ranges over the park started ragging on me. They said, only Randy tried to do a fornication to him. <laughs> you can't do a fornication to him. I said, you watch. So what I did was I did a little research on the vice activities that took place here mm -hmm. in Petersburg, mm -hmm. and they were rampant. But if you compare what was written in the newspaper here, you would think this was the it was Vatican City or something, you know, or you know, some of the most uh, upright and religious place in the world. Uh, Richmond's another story. Richmond was very, very upfront in the newspaper about what happened. There was always articles in there about so and so's house got raided. They arrested some high-ranking Confederate officers. Uh, they arrested these women for running houses of bill repute and things of that sort. Uh, or the Mrs. So and So's uh, board house was shut down, you know, because it was actually uh, a house of prostitution. <laughs> so you, you see different ways of looking at. Uh, the whole problem uh, all over the all over the South, and it wasn't confined just to Petersburg and Richmond, Nashville, uh, Knoxville, all, Atlanta. All the major cities all had vice problems, and of course they had vice problems before the war, but it was even more so, you know, doing it. Now, what we'll be doing is we'll be walking around, and I'm going to be acting as a newspaper reporter here in Petersburg, <coughs> interviewing people we encounter and getting their impression of what's going on here at Petersburg. And uh, at the end of each scene, if you want to ask us some questions, you're welcome to do so. <laughs> but since we're on a little bit of a time crunch, if I say we need to move on, we need to move on. And at the end, we'll, we'll maybe address that question even more. Uh, Petersburg was a booming city. It had about 16,000 people in 1861. <coughs> rather than 1860 census. Now about two-thirds of them were black and half of those were free. It had the second highest uh, rate of free blacks in the entire country. Only New Orleans had more. Uh, there were basically four wards here. Uh, you had one that was the, the up crust, then you had two that were basically middle class and lower class, and then you had another one that was uh, lower class, but it was also mixed. It was uh, blacks and whites living right next door to each other. So it was a rather interesting town. Uh, had Pocahontas over here, which was a, the second oldest uh, free black community. And they had their problems over there too. Now you can, um, if you look at the city directory, you'll see that there are, there are hotels, there are boarding houses, there are uh, taverns, not many, and nothing like what we would call a bar necessary. A few saloons, that was more of a bar kind of a thing. Uh, but it also had usually some kind of, of entertainment in there too. Uh, you had restaurants, and some of the, the, and the boarding houses were interesting because a lot of widows or single women owned these boarding houses. And, but if you go back and look at the record, you'll find that usually if the thing was run by a single woman, yeah, this might be a house of prostitution too. So the things were kind of uh, hidden, you know, in, in the community. But, uh, and I think you'll sort of be surprised at uh, the range of people that you run into. Now today we're going to run into some civilians and run into some, uh, some soldiers. And the, the, the being behind the lines made it somewhat difficult because like in Richmond, 
Uh, you had a polo marshal for Richmond, but he mainly just dealt with the, the soldiers themselves. And they had a civilian law enforcement there. Down here, they also had a city marshal. Uh, but he was overwhelmed, basically, and with all the refugees that came into the, into the city. Uh, and also, with the number of soldiers that were back and forth through the town, both on official business and on pass. And when soldiers on pass, they don't, they're not under that strict military discipline that you find back in camp. So they tend to do just like soldiers would do now and go wild. And uh, so a lot of the people in the city uh, who had friends and relatives that were in the military were certainly sympathetic to them. People who did not were maybe less so. Uh, people who got victimized by some of these soldiers were even less so. And so it, it didn't really pose a problem. And because you had a situation where all of the city is pretty much surrounded on the south side, um, and the military is going to restrict movement. So they're going to have a polo marshal marching around through town, uh, patrolling around through town, checking people and asking them for uh, passes. And we'll actually visit the location of the original polo marshal. It's a, a vacant lot now. It's, it's where the, the military police chief uh, basically had his operation. They didn't have a professional military police force like the Army does now. They would designate an officer, uh, depending on the size of the garrison or whatever, maybe a captain all the way up through to the colonel. Uh, the Army would have a Provost Marshal General. And, but what he had for patrolmen were basically a shot up, non combat effective infantry unit that was maybe way under strength. They couldn't put up in a line, but they didn't want to disband it, so they would send it uh, over here, assign them to the Provo Marshal, and then he would use them to patrol through the city. All right, so let's. Have we got any questions to start with? All right, let's move on to our first.